All right, so this thing, I always wondered uh, the identities of these two things, which I could not figure it out. So I'm going to give you a general guess of what these two identities are. So generally, generally, Bible-believing preachers would say that these two identities are the following. And for now, I can only go by that because it seems like the most reasonable. Okay, so I'll explain to you the two mysterious identities. Chapter 10, verse 1. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven clothed with a cloud. Okay, so then, remember, there were previously trumpets being sounded off by seven angels, correct? Now, when they were uh, blowing out the trumpets, all of a sudden, what John sees is a mighty angel, so a strong angel, coming down from heaven. Now, when he comes down from heaven, he's clothed with a cloud, it says, actually. Now, angels obviously do not have wings, but that's a different story. I'm just drawing it. That way, people don't get confused over here. So, But it says that he was clothed with the cloud. So it's, I know, it's kind of strange. So it's like a cloud form, but you're going to find out later on where his legs are going to land. And then it will give a little bit more of a clue on who this angel is actually. So he's clothed with the cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head. Now, if you recall the previous verses in Revelation, then you could probably guess this identity, and it's a pretty good guess, actually. So think about a, a person that you know of throughout the Bible. This magnet is not under you. So, in the Bible, think about a particular person that you know of from the beginning of Revelation 1 all the way to chapter 10. One who is clothed with the cloud. One who actually has a rainbow nearby him. And let's keep reading. Upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet were as pillars of fire. So his face is glowing like the sun. And then it says that his feet were as pillars of fire. Now think about it. Who is this person? Let's look at several passages. Some of you are already having a right guess. That's why it's, this would be the identity of this mighty angel would be Jesus. So let's start with Revelation 1. It matches a lot with Revelation 1. Remember Revelation 1 was talking about Jesus? where the black Hebrew Israelite think that he was black because, uh, you know, about burning brass, etc. But no, that was referring to Revelation 10, this one right here. See? Revelation chapter 1 and verse 15. So this is Jesus, remember? We know that. And his feet like unto fine brass, as if they were burned in a furnace. See that? So it seems to match up. Another thing is you'll notice as well at verse 7, talking about Jesus Christ, behold, he cometh with what? Clouds, clouds and what? Every eye shall see him. Look at that. So he's clothed with the cloud and every eye sees him. Isn't that interesting? That's referring to Jesus again. Uh, look at Revelation chapter 5. Revelation 5. Or Revelation 4, excuse me, Revelation chapter 4. Look at verse 3, verse 3. Notice, and he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and sarding stone, and there was a what? Rainbow round about the throne. Remember, the rainbow was around the throne, above his head. Who's sitting at the throne at verse 2? That's God. See that right there? So this seems to really match up with Jesus Christ. Not only that, you might wonder, but pastor, it said angel, not Jesus. Ah, this is where you got to know your basic doctrines here. So you'll notice right here that even though it says angel, in your Old Testament, do you recall somebody? 
at the Old Testament where it was the angel of the Lord exactly and the angel of the Lord when you read your Old Testament was no ordinary angel the angel was referred to as God himself now think about this Jacob he wrestled uh, with with a man at the middle of the night so this angel was uh, really in man form. And then when Joseph was uh, struggling with his angel, he said that he saw the face of God. Yeah. Why? Because that was the angel of the Lord. Yeah. So think about this. This is something that people don't realize. If you want to prove Jesus Christ to a Jew, well, God has no image. No, then who was Jacob fighting with? Then? That's good. That's and this is the best proof that to a Jewish person where you can prove from his Jewish Old Testament there's Jesus Jesus is God God has a human form they don't believe in that but you can show them with the angel of the Lord so pull up every verse in the Old Testament about angel of the Lord sometimes it can refer to a regular angel we know that but a lot of times it refers to God himself so this is a powerful passage where you can uh, show to Jews that Jesus is not just the Messiah, but he is God manifest in the flesh. Now, that means then, wait a minute, Pastor, then if this is God manifest in the flesh, then Jesus had a pre-incarnate form. Yeah, so here's the thing. So the incarnation, that's something you got to know. That's a term that is used in biblical theology you want to know. I don't know if any of you heard about the term incarnation of Christ? What does that mean? The incarnation of Christ is basically where God came down in human form, and that was Jesus. That's what we mean by incarnation of Christ. But we say, but God did come in human form before Jesus came on this earth. So that's why we say that the angel of the Lord is great evidence concerning about Jesus being the angel of the Lord. Jesus is God, the deity of Christ, and we also call it a pre-incarnate form. So this is a pre-incarnate form of Christ, which is extremely interesting right here. So that's why it builds up a lot of evidence right here that this angel at Revelation chapter 10 can be very likely referring to Jesus Christ, the angel of the Lord. Why? Because too many verses match up with that. All right, let's return to our main text here. Revelation chapter 10. There was one more identity here. He mentioned that his face was like at, as the sun, correct? So I forgot to mention that part. So because his face was like glowing like the sun... You're going to notice that Revelation 1.16, which I forgot to turn to, it says his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. So, there, so there's a lot of matching up with Jesus Christ over here. A lot of matching up with Jesus. Now, this is something also that's uh, interesting, which I'll explain a little later. We'll just go over here, Revelation chapter 10, verse 2. And he had in his hand, so Jesus had in his hand a what? A little book open. So he had a book open. Now what is this book though, right? So he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea. So you'll notice that one foot, his right foot, goes on the sea here and then the other foot is on where it's on land why is that so his left foot is on the earth and then his right foot's on the sea where is this location the location remember where we went back to let's go to Revelation chapter 13 and verse 1, 
No, actually, I didn't teach this. I taught this at Virginia, not this church. I'm, I'm sorry. Never mind. I confused my teaching at Virginia with this church. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry you missed out. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't online. I'm sorry. It was only for the church at Virginia. I was... <laughs> I, uh, the teaching was about uh, the uh, underwater world. So I went through all the underwater kingdoms from Genesis to Revelation. Yeah. But anyways, let's go to Revelation 13, verse 1. <laughs> Revelation 13, verse 1. <laughs> All right. <then. laughs> so you don't know what the sea is then. So I'll explain what the sea is. This sea, what we believe, I don't know if I, I probably did say it here. I, I don't remember. But the sea is the Mediterranean Sea. Okay, so I did say that here. Okay, yeah. All right. Oh, great. I didn't have to say Virginia then. Oh, man. Oh, well, anyway, so the Mediterranean Sea. And then right here then would be, if you can, you can guess then, it will be Israel. Amen. Okay, why do we say that this is the Mediterranean Sea over here? Because, let's read the text over here. Verse 1, and I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea. That's the Antichrist. Having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. So notice it's showing you a location where the Antichrist is coming from. And it mentions the sea here. Now we know in Daniel chapter, so I didn't really teach it in this class, but if you go to Daniel chapter 11, we're going to go there now. Daniel chapter 11, and then I could probably explain more when we go to Revelation 13 eventually. The reason why we believe that's the Mediterranean Sea is because, number one, the focus of the book of Revelation, there's no doubt the geography location is Israel. It gives too many geographical names. It talks about Megiddo. It talks about Armageddon. It talks about Jerusalem. So if all the attention is on Israel's location, so the sea that it would be referring to is a Mediterranean Sea. Not only that, it's talking about where the birthplace, the origin of the Antichrist, where he's coming from. Well, his birthplace, what you're going to find out is that he is a Syrian Jew. So because he's a Syrian Jew, what sea location is nearby there? It's a Mediterranean Sea. All right, so let's look at Daniel chapter 11. And then how I'm going to make this simplified. So I did it in a different video, but I'll try to do it at this one. So we look at verse 4. And when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken. That's talking about Alexander the Great at verse 2. His kingdom's divided. And shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven, and not to his posterity, nor according to his dominion which he ruled. For his kingdom shall be plucked up even for others besides those. So notice that his uh, kingdom splits into four parts. And what you're going to find out is that those four parts, it's going to consist later on, we see the conflict from verses 5 all the way through 21, king of the north versus king of the south. If you're going to find a historical timeline that matches with Alexander the Great after his generals divided into four parts, the conflict is going to be with Syria and Egypt. That's what you're going to find out throughout history. So that's why we believe right here that when the Antichrist is referred to as what? The king of the north at verse, let's see right here. Uh, no, no, that's, uh, that's historical. We got to jump to uh, doctrinal here. Verse 18, after this shall he turn his face unto the isles and shall take many. But a prince for his own behalf shall cause a reproach offered by him to cease. Without his own reproach, he shall cause it to turn upon him. So it's continuing on these kings at 1920, but then it calls him king of the north. Uh, so 14, 14 is the south. There we go, 14 and 15. There we go. So 14 and 15 mentions the king of the south conflicts with the king of the north. So then, well, it's talking about the king of the north from verse 15. Verse 20 talks about that raiser of taxes at verse 20. Yeah. So the king of the north. Then verse 21 continues him, the king of the north. And in his estate shall stand up a vile person. So someone's going to take over the position of the king of the north position. This is thousands of years later. This is the Antichrist. How do you know? 
to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. And with the arms of a flood shall they be overflown from before him and shall be broken. Yea, also the prince of the covenant, and after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully. So there's no doubt right there, there's the Antichrist. We see that. But he's referred to as the king of the north. Okay, so then if we were to take from verses 5 through uh, 23, the conflict with king of south, king of north. I mentioned the historical application fulfillment that we see it fulfilled was Syria and Egypt, right? History proves that, actually. After Alexander the Great, the kingdom split four parts. Syria and Egypt always had this conflict. But then you'll notice, so then king of south would be then Egypt, king of north, Syria. That's where we get the idea of the Antichrist is from the Syrian region. But it becomes even more plain when you look at Isaiah chapter 11, where the Bible calls the Antichrist a Syrian. And Syria, the region of Syria, be, uh, you got to realize Assyria was, used to be the one that took over that whole domain over there. So there's no doubt. Okay, anyways, so we know he's Syrian, but then he's Jewish, how we realize that, is because of verse 37. Neither shall he regard the God of his father. So notice right here that it's talking about he's denying the true God of his forefathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard what? Any God. See that? So then this true God is distinguished from the false God here. So this is the true God of the Bible, God of his fathers. Wait, you heard that turn, right, throughout the Old Testament? Our forefathers, our fathers, our fathers. That's a Jewish thing. And there was no Christian that existed at that time, so it's pretty obvious. This is talking about his forefathers, Jewish forefathers, true God. Because that was the only true God of the Bible that time is a Jewish God. So thus he's Jewish. So he's a Syrian Jew. See? So that's where we get that idea. But that's just a quick breakdown. I had a more thorough video on that. So going back to Revelation 13, that's why it makes sense that since the beast is from Syria and Israel, then the sea where Revelation 13, 1, that the Antichrist is originating from, would make sense to be the Mediterranean Sea. That's why it makes sense when you go to Revelation 10 that the location would be the Mediterranean, because it's talking about sea again at Revelation 10 verse 1, which matches with Revelation 13, 1. Somebody else comes out of the sea. Now think about it. Satan comes out of the Mediterranean Sea. You ever wonder why? Because he's trying to imitate Jesus at Revelation 10, 1. See? where he's claiming, no, this is my property here. Yeah. But Satan wants to take that for himself, right? Mm -hmm. Throughout history, Satan's forces, even in modern century today, today and after biblical history, during the past 2,000 years, you see satanic forces that always wanted that piece of land for some strange reason. I mean, that place is like, uh, I mean, what good do you want that land? Why that land? You know, it's not a pretty place. Why? Because why do so many people die, bleed, and fight for that? Because that's God's property, and they know that. That's why you hear a lot of conspiracies as well of different elites who try to t claim it. And finally, they will claim it through the Antichrist. But there are already demonic forces at work and elites already who have a foothold in Israel. But then the Antichrist, he's going to take full control and full reign. He'll take that real soon. 